You can find all sorts of weird and wonderful engines at the National Railway Museum. Today, we look at one that is simply impossible to miss. In fact, it's the largest engine they have. KF class number seven is so big that even though it is a standard gauge engine, it's simply impossible to run on the UK network. So why is it here? Why does the National Railway Museum have an engine that has never set foot on UK rails preserved for the nation? It's not recognisable and world leading like the bullet train and many similar size classes that we associate with our railway, like the Mikado, may have deserved the spot where the KF class sits. But its history is a brilliant one. It involves kidnapping, friendship and the fall of a centuries old empire. And we're going to dwell right into it. To look at this engine's history, we need to go back 34 years prior to the engine's construction. Imperial China was under threat by Western influences, and many in the, within the country were fighting for change and an end to the Qing dynasty. Sun Yat-san, who was at the forefront of the revolution, wanted to end the imperialist rule and mould China into a republic. His revolutionary tactics and his support for the uprising in China forced him into exile. Eventually, he ended up in London. Son's former teacher, James Cantley, was the father of engineering pioneer, Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Cantley, and both teacher and student were lifelong friends. They were so close that James named San Yet San as his son's godfather. In 1896, Sun Yat-san was forcibly taken from his home and detained at the Chinese legislation in London by the Chinese Imperial Secret Service. The service planned to smuggle San out of exile to China, where he would answer for his crimes and ultimately be executed. For 12 days, James rallied any power he could to free San. He contacted the Globe, the Times and even the Foreign Office. Eventually, after immense pressure, Sam was freed to a hero's welcome, much to James's relief. After the Boxer Revolution left Imperial China facing an indemnity payment to Western powers, and after the 1911 Wuxiang Uprising, a meeting of representatives elected Sam as the first provisional president of the new Republic of China, with January 1st, 1912 being the first year. Sam was credited for funding the revolution and keeping the revolutionary spirit alive. He passed in 1925, and even though his loss created a power vacuum which rumbled through the Second World War, he would forever be remembered as the father of the nation. It's almost certain that San's legacy may have influenced the KF. The Gangdong and Hankou Railway had just completed a new line stretching from Gangsu to Xiaogan, but were in a desperate search to find a locomotive that could run it. The line wasn't a simple one. It had very steep gradients, sharp curves and a low capacity bridges. The new engine would have to have more tractive effort but retain a low axle load and it had to have the ability to consume low quality coal and water and must contend with the extremely low temperatures in winter and high in summer. Kenneth Cantley was one of the trustees of the indemnity fund and an advisor to the Chinese railway. He wanted to incorporate American design to the new locomotive and he knew the new engine was going to need to be big. He designed a mechanical stoker, bar frames and a new wheel arrangement never before built in the UK. Meanwhile, despite the British Railway being the most experienced and one of the best locomotive builders in the world at the time, British works were seeing a slump in new orders. Five different works competed for the new tender and after much decision the Vulcan Foundry was awarded the contract. The works produced 24 new KFs and shipped them to China. Ironically, the new engines were paid for from the Boxer Indemnity Fund and it was specifically stipulated that the engines must be British made. The engines were a large success but not much was really known about their running history. The Boxer Indemnity Fund and World War II caused China to isolate from the rest of the Western world. 
We do know that the engines were running alongside the main line for several years and was even pictured running when Richard Nixon made a surprise visit to China in 1972. In one of the newsreels showing Nixon, it is clear a KF was visible in the background. This would have meant that the engines were still in good steam even after Japan's new bullet trains were introduced. In 1979, the Republic of China reached out to the National Railway Museum and offered KF No. 7 as a goodwill gift from the people of China. As the only example of a KF available, the museum accepted the gift with open arms, and work began to bring the KF back to its homeland. Because of its large size, it was not able to be transported by rail, so it was shipped by special delivery by ship and road. The engine was eagerly received in 1981 and restored back to its prime for display in 1983. Out of the 24 builds, only two now survive. KF No. 7 is safe in York, while its brother is preserved for the nation at the Beijing Railway Museum. So let's have a bit of a closer look. Many unusual features were incorporated into the engine. On the six of the engines, a booster engine was installed, which helped drive the rear axle of the leading tender's bogey. If the engine did not receive a booster, then provisions were made to add one at a later date. It's not known if this was actually done on the remaining 18 engines once they went into service. Because of the low quality fuel the engine would be running on, the, end, the boiler had to be the most effective it could be. The firebox grate allowed for 67 square feet of heating room with an ash pan with discharging doors so that the large amounts of ash could be swept away from the boiler tubes quickly. As mentioned before, a mechanical stoker was introduced, feeding the engine automatically from the tender. The stoker was steam driven and got the steam from the super header heater. The super header heater would feed the steam, not only to the steam chests, but to the stoker, the booster, the chime whistle, the air pump and the turbo generator. All of these could be controlled individually from the cab, allowing for the most economical running of the engine. The boiler was supported on its saddle casing by bar frames rather than the standard chassis, with breather plates and sliding shoes along the firebox and barrel, and sand and the sand for the wheels was kept dry from a specially built sand dome located on the top of the boiler. The tender itself held a staggering 11 tonnes of coal and 6,600 gallons of water, more than double the nose of standard British steam engines. Even though their running history is mostly lost to us. This engine had a very interesting journey and deserves its place in the Great Hall. Its unique history and lineage certainly sets it apart from its fellow engines. That, at its sheer size, means it's an engine that few can miss. <laughs>